little few minutes, I will talk to you about the St. Lawrence Project. And you've heard some of the, uh, the project and the work um, that has been done already today when Lee Harper talked about the common turn restoration effort. And uh, we had this great talk about Bullion Bay and ephemera funds. All that, all that money is coming out of, out of the, uh, the settlement that occurred with the Moses Saunders Dam hydro relicensing that occurred in 2003. And I just wanted to spend a few minutes today just talking about what's going on at the other end of the river. And, and um, Jessica Jock and was great this morning. Uh, we had such great speakers today. It's just very impressive. Um, there are actually people here like Lee Harper who actually can do this talk much, much better than I. Is Lee still here? Maybe Lee should come up and talk about this. Because he spent so much time uh, at that end of the lake working on these projects. But, but Jessica brought to mind, um, and Judy wanted to talk about staffing cuts and how much we've lost. Uh, we had an area of concern meeting in January, I think. And at, th at that time, Jessica announced that the tribe had gotten the two different grants, about $2 million, and how great that was. And, and then they had their new wildlife technician there to talk about the fur bear work they're going to do and the work they're going to look at fish tumors. And, and I, little bells were going off in my, in my mind, like, oh, I know Dave Mayak in Albany, and who is our DEC's expert on toxicology and fur bears. And so I, I should get them together. And, and they're talking about fish tumors, and I thought, oh, I know, you know, uh, you know this guy, this Skinner, and, and he's worked on, you know, fish tumors and, and fish toxicology. And I was thinking of all the people that I had to bring together to work with them. And then uh, when I got drove home that evening after the meeting, I thought, oh, dang, they're all retired. <laughs> and, I, and that's the reality that we we live in is that with with my generation of careerists, with over 30 years as we get these opportunities to leave, we leave and all this 30 years of expertise from the beginning of the environmental movement leave with us without any transfer of all that knowledge and information. So then I said to Albany, I said, you know, we really would like people to come and meet with us in the tribe to talk about past department work and these efforts throughout the state along uh, the Hudson River and along Lake Ontario. And uh, they said, well, well, we can probably get people up there who can speak about it well, but right now we don't have any travel money. So <laughs> when we talk about budgeting, it, sometimes it gets that, that down and nuts and bolts that you can't, don't even have money to get in a car to drive across the state to go to a meeting. So we're wondering how Donzel has got here today. I'm in route to Buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, who's, who are you trying to do? A little detour. A little just, detour. Just so that you know, Judy and I have already blown our budget. So <laughs> no, no charging in the reason sense. But anyway, it works. You know, this is the whole issue. I think you're all aware of it. You've heard this message over and over again about construction this constructing this massive dam structure and well we had that great discussion this morning uh, about the uh, fault line and i was reading the other day i think it's under um, our side of the river uh, turbine number four the, where the fault line runs and so you're ready downstream for the next uh, big earthquake because it's under turbine four but just an incredible feat but but the end result has been in this this massive ecosystem um, change that we have these, and, and I don't mean to be critical because I'm not, but we, we have these band-aid approaches that I'm going to talk about, and, and we just saw the Blind Bay, which are simply band-aids to this massive water regulation change that no longer mimics the natural system, but, but is controlled by this dam and then, then 30 miles upstream with the airport dam. And so we have these, these massive dam structures controlling the flow of this, this huge river and altering the ecology for, for all these miles. Um, <clears throat> and you all know about water level changes and regulation. You've heard it a million times, and we had a discussion today, and if we could just take this graph, and if we could just shift it, like over here, so that we had the highest water in April and early May, um, we'd go a long ways to, to restoring water level regulation to more natural flow. I spent a lot of my career managing Lake Champlain. And Lake Champlain, believe it or not, this 120 mile up 9 mile lake goes up and down 6 feet over a year. And yet here, what do we see? You know, we're, we're talking about a matter of meters now, or just a meter, um, on the river. And yet the peaking is totally wrong for, for aquatic ecosystems. It's occurring in June and July, or July and August. And then what we see is a, 
a rapid decline in the water levels, and then it, it continues right through the winter. And um, one thing, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about, about fisheries and the destruction of fisheries and the, um, and the cattail monoculture that's forming in all our, in our wetland bays. And the fact that what happens is, and it's all linked to another critter, which you don't hear people talking about, and that's the muskrat. And the fact that, that the water level regulation that we right now have on the river um, seeks to destroy mu muskrat populations. And muskrat populations are those critters that are great herbivores. They eat up all the cattail, and they make these channels that now we're trying to do band-aid approaches to. And the muskrats get in there, they eat all year long, they have an incredible reproductive potential, you know, three litters a year, you know, four, four kits a year, you know, if you have a litter in, in, in April or May, you know, the ones that you had in April or May might be reproducing in July. Incredible reproductive potential, producing all these critters, and that's all they want to do is eat cattle. And so they can have such a dramatic impact on controlling this monoculture of cattails, and yet we have a system that is before you that, that denies them, because as soon as they build, we get to this period right here, and it's September, early October, they're putting, they're putting down their feed beds and their, and their little um, lodges and everything based on this water level here, right here, and then we get down to December and they're froze out of their home. And they all, they're forced to, um, if they're not froze out totally, they're forced to cross open ground, and you all know what happens when you're a muskrat, you're walking across open ground, you get eaten. So um, there's a lot of, and then, and then you lose your population. So, there's a, so everything is linked together. It's just not a simple cattail fisheries, it's cattail muskrat. And we're going to talk about the other problems with dewatering with her, um, reptiles and amphibians in a second. And, and actually, as Lee spoke today, and we're, we're thinking about how we're building all these artificial nest structures for turns, I wondered, is the lack of ice scouring across some of our islands with ice damming you know, in the spring as we get the ice out, is that removing turn, turn habitat that might have existed in a natural system that we've now eliminated? Lee, what do you think? I, you know, I, I thought about that. All these relationships of stable water levels, where we're not getting this big flush in the spring that's scouring islands and removing vegetation, making bare rock, and all the things that turns may be. And then, then if we get down to the other end of the lake, uh, we not only have this massive seasonal change, which, which is all screwed up, but we also have these hourly changes that could be a meter or you know over a half a day or a day period. We're getting a meter change in water level as we approach approach the dam. And again, we're we're destabilizing these entire systems. So I mean, you know, most people we know that there's a seasonal rhythm, but but then as you approach the peaking process of power generation, then we're getting the same effect uh, downstream along uh, Lake St. Lawrence. So um, <coughs> We had this process that we started in the late 90s and was completed in 2003, which was the relicensing of the um, Moses Saunders FDR project. And what that did then is uh, the initial license that allowed the St. Lawrence project to run expired, and they had to renew their um, federal energy requirement license, their FERC license, to, to manage um, the system, and I know this organization and many organizations were greatly involved with that, um, that relicensing procedure. What came out of it then was a series of agreements. We talked about the fish, um, the femur, what we call femurs, and now it's, it's a fish enhancement mitigation restoration fund. That's $24 million. Um, there's a whole bunch of other funds that come with it. There's local funds, obviously, for parks and mobile on sites. There's an educational and outreach fund. There's a fund, um, a, a additional HIPS fund. That's why I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about HIPS before we all go have a beer. But the Habitat Improvement uh, Project Fund. So there's a big chunk of money there. Um, and I would be um, remiss to, to, before I start talking about these few projects that we're on to show you some pictures of. Is, um, it also gave us the ability and the structure to hire staff to um, do full-time management of, of the Lake St. Lawrence projects in the HIPS and, and Wilson Hill. And that was, uh, you know, here we talk about staff reductions and, and hiring, or uh, not an inability to hire. And we finally had the opportunity then to hire two people, which we've done in the last year. Um, but believe it or not, here we had Power Authority of New York saying we have this money to hire two people. DEC, because of our, um, our 
number of bodies and fills that we have approved by the governor's office, we, they couldn't accept the money, believe it or not. So we had money given to us, we couldn't accept it, but we were allowed um, to go through another process called the, uh, uh, the uh, Natural Heritage Trust, which is sort of a pseudo agency that allows us to take money and put people in temporary type of positions. And so we were allowed to put them into, so we could still get the people, and they didn't count against DEC's total number of employees. So there's a little game there, but the end result was very positive because now we have two people working, devoting, devoting their careers to working at Wilson Hill and implementation of many of the HIPS um, uh, habitat improvement projects on, on the lower end around Lake St. Lawrence between the, uh, the Moses Saunders Dam and Lake Iroquois. And I know Lee Harper is very involved with, with our guys, and, and they've been out in the field to do a lot of work together, which is greatly appreciated. So I just want to take like five more minutes and run through some of these projects so you can get an idea and a feel of what we're working with, like, are working with, much like you just saw for the Blind Bay um, restoration activity. Coles Creek is a real big project. It's 105 acres of wetland. Um, it involves three major components. One is fish passage and construction. Second is emergent marsh restoration and actual plantings. And the third is in, 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 uh, controlling invasive species. Uh, here's the uh, Col Col Creek Weir at Route 37. You drive over Coles Creek, and, and this is where the weir is right here. There's a notch in the, in the weir uh, so that uh, northern pike and other species can run up into the wetland. And what this does is allows us, just as you heard earlier, this weir allows us to uh, control and manage water levels in, in a, a more natural way, holding uh, more stable summer um, levels, high spring levels, and reduce in the fall if we need to. Another part is this is the, uh, <coughs> the restoration effort that occurred on Coles Creek. Were you a part of that? Plantings? On the edge. Yeah. It's very impressive. You wait till you see the next slide. This, this is a cattle a cattle pasture where a farmer had his cattle going right out into the to the wetland area. Uh, well, it was supposed to be a wetland area, right out into the water. Um, interesting place because he has a, a guard llama. And so you go look at this site and you always, right? You gotta watch out for this damn llama because I don't know, he's the meanest animal you can ever find. I mean, you know, he'd be worse than five pit bulls. But uh, making sure that the, the workers who set up this grid, the grid, see the grid, remember Lee talked about keeping the geese out of the, uh, the turn nesting areas, and the grid here not only helps you mark your plantings, but it also keeps the geese from pulling up all these little baby plants. That went in. So this is, this is the first planting, and that's what it looks like this summer. So that's pretty impressive, isn't it? From a big mud flat, all disturbed, to a, to a nice, very diverse wetland, and by the way, it's not totally cattail. Um, here's another one, a little sucker brook, approved um, and controlled fish passage to a 100 acre impoundment, managed water levels to enhance aquatic vegetation. It's going to be constructed in 2012, also been involved a fish, fish passage um, under Route 37 and a pump house to allow us actually to pump water in and out. Of it. You can see here, see if I can do this. You can see um, this is where the pump station is going to be. Here's Route 37 heading north. Um, here's where the water control structure will be with a fish wave. And um, okay, this is a huge project. Um, um, NIPA has, I, someone had told me, and I don't know if it's totally, totally factual, we spent about $18 million or will by the time we're done at Wilson Hill Wildlife Management Area trying to improve the management of that area, building new dikes, new water, water control structures, and doing things to begin to allow us to manage it, once again, water levels in a more natural area. One of the most important parts of this whole project is the construction of a huge new dike system with um, water control structures that will allow us to flood an area and maintain it for northern pike spawning. Um, I want to just mention here, this is what the area looks like right now, and as you can see as we get into the fall, the leaves are gone, you see how the whole area is being dewatered? There's, no, uh, there's no vegetation in here, and this is going to eventually even get bigger, a big mud flat essentially, so we've taken this wetland ecosystem, we've turned it into a mud flat.